Hello everybody, welcome to Planet FPL, the world where everything revolves around fantasy Premier League. My name's Serge. And my name is James. And you think we should do it price and position wise. Today's chat is about price. God, I feel like you're shouting. Am I really loud? <laughs> Sorry listeners, if you have headphones in and you're on the tube or wherever else and I've blown your ears away. Oh, it reminds me to go um, in airplane mode. Cheers. Airplane. Um, well, the tube reminded you of airplane mode, eh? No, you, your voice with distortion would be really loud. bad. Loud. Um, today we're talking about pricing. Praise the Lord. Thank you, FPL Towers, uh, for opening the game yesterday because we would have had to uh, work with a smaller pool of players. Uh, I mean, there was a good 200 odd that were released anyway, even if not more, over the weekend and Monday. So we knew a lot and we would have been able to do this pod anyway. But the game is open, James. Yeah, it's a relief because there are certain learnings from. Um, price reveal of all the players in terms of structures and stuff some really really interesting bottom line cheap players not so much in the forward area but keepers defenders midfielders I want to talk about a bit that we wouldn't have had the information for this time yesterday for example mm, I think the uh, the overriding generally I suppose some general uh, kind of reactions from people are prices are lower than they thought they would be which is across the board bar a handful of players that you're like why um, and the other thing is that um, with prices being lower, the midfield and forward spots, though, the 4.5 and 5 million stuff in those areas isn't as good as the 4 and 4.5 million at the defender stage. And so you want to go big at the back. But if you go big at the back, you're compromising your bench. Yep. Whereas if you have midfielders and forwards your cheap defenders means a better bench in depth. And I think people are going to have to make that choice now around around big at the back. Yeah, because Chilwell and James and all these players are cheap, but then your midfield and forward bench slots are going to be garbage potentially. I, I didn't find a lot in that bargain basement that I thought was interesting. Well, I've got a few names. There are a few. On this pod. There are a few. I'm talking forwards, midfielders and forwards. But I, I wasn't excited or enthused in any which way. Uh, difficult to be excited. We knew all the prices, really, yeah. anyway. The, the one that really stood out from the, the pricing that we didn't have yesterday, and I think anybody who looks at the ownership numbers can, can see that, and it's it's a, an agreed opinion for a lot of people, is, is Jesus. I said on the pod to you yesterday, well, oh, if Jesus drops at 8.5, that's suddenly going to be quite interesting. Very, he, he dropped, dropped at 8. eight. Mm. To be honest, if he was to play 38 games, he's, I think he got 16 attacking returns last year for City, eight goals, eight assists, um, and played just over half the minutes. If you got him up to sort of 80% of the minutes, he's going to score better than any other forward. I think so. Even if right. he just repeats that. Mm. 20 goals, I'll off. have him down for. But um, obviously, we've got the new introduction of the, the likes of Holland and I what mean, have the you. Comparable forwards at that mm. price, by the way. I'm not saying he's going to score yeah. better than Holland or. Kane, for example. Yeah. I know you've always um, said that you would like prices to be more expensive because it makes the game more difficult. Uh, and I've made the, the point previously that they can do it either way. Making the prices more expensive or making them all cheaper has the same effect because you're widening the pool of players that people can go to. And I think we're seeing that now with the prices being cheaper, people having to make really interesting decisions like that 8 million midfield bracket. Full of good players. Kulu, Mount, Louis Diaz. You could chuck Bowen in, even though he's a little bit more expensive. And there's others of that 8 million bracket. I've, I think there are a lot of decisions to be made. Yet, if you go into the app right now and you do team selected by, there isn't a spread. <laughs> no. Um, we've clearly got a seven-player starting template already. The four defenders, uh, Trent, Cancelo, Reese, James, Perisic, all over 40% owned. Mo Salah's at that. Those what? numbers are monster. For defenders? Monster. It's crazy. Yeah. Man. And that's what I'm saying. It's too cheap from that perspective. There's no point complaining about it. It's what they've done. Um, I feel like what they've done is, it, you say made the pool bigger. They've eliminated a lot of problems in the middle. Mm-hmm. Like, there's not many kind of 5 million defenders that are going to really stand out. Yeah, I think no. you can... You can jump and punt, like I say punt, you can have them for longer. The likes of Matty Cash, Kieran Trippier for a bit longer and stuff. But those defender prices, the problem is 
and it's long been spoke about by so many content creators. You have people like um, Reese James at six million. Compare Reese James at six million to any midfielder at the same price, and if you know Reese James gets the minutes, he's gonna he's gonna outscore all them. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's the point, isn't it? Mm. So though you got those four defenders all over forty percent owned. You've got Mo at sixty percent owned, despite yep. being comfortably the highest uh, price player in the game. Holland over sixty percent. Yep. And Jesus has obviously just come in yesterday. So it's not even like people have had time to process that in advance. Well over 40%. Those seven, that's template now. Now things will happen. We've got, what, four weeks till the season starts. One of them's going to get injured or something or be doubtful for the starting game and, and it will change something like that. But if if those seven players all have a decent pre-season, they're going to, I mean, any one of them could potentially kill you at the start. And judging by what we discussed yesterday about looking for the fixtures for those clubs, because those players are all from four, four teams. We've all got decent, uh, five teams, sorry, decent starting fixtures. Last season's top five. They all have a good run at the start as well. What else are you looking for? Thing is, the only sort of thing I feel like, is a perfect example, I think it's sort of like Reese James, Ben Shilwell. So Ben Shilwell at the moment is about 15% of the team. It looks like people clearly prefer James. Now, a lot of that's probably because Chilwell only come back for like bias, last day of the season. Mm. Chilwell's points per game last year is, was absurd. It was like nine points per game or something. But we also don't know if he's going to kind of be ready to hit the start of the season running. But that's the sort of one where I look at it and go, okay, can I go with Chilwell versus James? James. Yeah, I probably can. Just a point on the seven players, particularly, if their ownership stay at these sort of level, what's one of the things that FPL managers really obsess about at the start of the season? Yo. Could be one, yeah. But I was thinking in terms of from the pricing perspective, it's increasing value. Point point ones and point twos and these they're the guys, ones that if people come off, you'll be you'll be well, uh, how, taking a hit. how much can these guys actually go up mm. even at that yeah, sort of ownership? It's true. It's true. If Erling Holland's got sixty four percent ownership. Actually, how much higher can that go? Yep. You, you would need those players to really hit it at the start. Otherwise, let's say everyone's going with Haaland. Kane gets that trick opening day. <sighs> Even despite the fixtures, you know that's the way it will swing. Yep. So, and the, and early, early, early part of the season, a point one may as well be a point five, right? Because you're not be able to cash in any value to jump on so if 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 Kane goes up from 11.5 to 11.6 you may as well have gone up to 12 because you need to find half a million in your players to get that 0.1 pip you know the way this game works if if Haaland blanks at West Ham opening day and Kane gets at it against Southampton people will move sideways from Haaland to Sunday. Kane even though on Sunday night even though the following week Haaland's got Bournemouth at home and Kane's got Chelsea away mm-hmm. so it's something to be conscious of from a Value, value perspective, yeah. But I think a lot of people. Uh, my my plan is to hold my nerve at the beginning and and, and not be chopping and changing too much. Uh, I originally had a strategy which was to you had a strategy. Well, thinking about um, a few few guests that we'd had on pods previously and what have you, which was to make it a five or six player game. This is before the price reveals. Like go big on five or six players and stop the rest. Whatever fours and fives and. 5.5s and and really just get the best six that I possibly can. City being priority, followed by Liverpool, and Spurs from an attacking point of view, and Chelsea maybe defensively. But what they've done with the pricing has made that everybody's strategy almost. So I didn't. I don't feel like uh, punting the bench and punting the fringe players is now a differential strategy. I feel it's going to be the way for a lot of people. But I didn't and haven't been overly enthused with the bottom end of the market, although you've said that you found some I interesting players. Few, yeah. I think defensively at 4.5, there's a very tidy list. Uh, I think the Arsenal boys, 100%. I think Bright, uh, Dunk at Brighton, definitely. I like Johnny at Wolves, I think is a good shout as well. There's plenty at 4.5 defensively. I didn't find much at 4 defensively. You seem to think there's a few. Yeah, we'll come on. I don't think these guys are going to get many minutes at all. Yeah, I, there are a few. Um, and There's mid- certainly three standouts, 4.0 defenders for Midfielders, me. Midfielders, uh, again, at 4.5, I think a lot of the ones that will play regularly that aren't going to score any points that are DMs like Romeu or Declan Rice, they're all at fives. Right? They're got, not at 4.5. I've got really interesting 4.5. Um, forwards, I didn't like anything at 4.5. Greenwoods, Dwight Gales. <sighs> 
No, the 4.5 no. forwards is not great. Um, you've got, obviously, Greenwood at Leeds. The, the, the one that might get a few minutes is Jordan Archer at Villa. Like it's difficult to foresee ahead of Danny Ings and Ollie Watkins, Ollie Watkins. that that will come round. But then you don't have to have free playing subs, do you? No. You could have a an Archer or a Greenwood or a similar 4.5 million forward. I wouldn't stress about that. I've seen a few mm. people, oh, four point, it's probably your third on your bench mm. if that's the way you're going. Yep. Don't stress about it too much. Yeah. Um, How much are we even going to need that bench as much this year? Considering, yes, we've discussed obviously about five subs and rotation and stuff. But these guys who get left out are more likely to get brought on as well, aren't they? That's true. And uh, what we do know as well is um, the unlimited transfers during the World Cup was confirmed yes. since we last recorded, which we thought would probably happen. But it means your wild card... I'm, ple- I'm pleased it has because I mentioned it so much. Uh, I think that it means the window of opportunity for your wild card is shorter. It forces you into probably using it within 10, 12 weeks uh, to try and get a really good use out of it. And so you don't have to plan as long term as well. Tomorrow's You can fix problems pretty quick. Tomorrow's pod, we're going to do chip strategy exclusively. Um, so we'll look at wildcard one ideas in more detail. Now we know. I didn't want to push it too much yesterday because we didn't know if this unlimited was going to happen or not. Now we do. Um, there are several different points where we can potentially look at wildcard one. Um, I think in summary, just to touch on it briefly, and we'll speak more tomorrow, probably open mind at the moment and be prepared to use it very early. Especially if that template bombs, right? Yes. If those seven players bomb, then maybe we need to, to move around and look at Robertson instead of Trent, Chilwell instead of Reese James. Spread the and money a little more. And they're not easy to... Mm. You know, uh, Cucurella instead of Cancelo and shove into your, your Bowens, your Madisons, Mounts, whatever, Kulazewskis that at the moment don't have too much ownership. It might be. Yeah, should we go position by position? Let's yes. have a look at what, what they've kind of done. So goalkeepers, no six million goalkeepers. When you make the argument about... The I like this, of, by the uh, way. But when you make the argument of the likes of Rhys James and um, Chilwell will outscore six million midfielders or forwards, Alisson and Edison will probably outscore 5.5 million midfielders and forwards quite comfortably. Alisson's been in the 170s quite a few seasons, uh, barring injury. Edison's always in that 160, 170, 180 bracket as well. That's a fair haul for a 5.5 million player. Yep. Edison is so consistent as well. If you look at his uh, returns by season, just his points, uh, 155, 160, 133 was when they did the, the Badger and Liverpool were very clear. 169, 158. So we know on average, if, if City performed to expectation... He's probably going to be in somewhere sort of one five five to to one seventy, isn't he? Yeah, and we know that. Yeah, and if you said that, this is where it's got a little bit interesting. How many midfielders or do we think is going to they hit won't. that prop? But there are a few defenders. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Perisic, At five point five. Yeah. Um, I mentioned obviously the above average FPL guys yesterday. They could kind of worked out what Perisic probably would get if he matched his Inter Milan returns from last season. And you're talking in sort of potentially the 230, 240 points level. Mm. Insane. That's not to say that that will happen. Um, but yeah, it's it's reasonable. I like what they've done from that perspective because the 6 million goalkeepers just weren't options, were they? Really? No, never. Unless you had sort of situations like with Chelsea where it become kind of murky in terms of who would play and stuff. And you thought, oh, I, I definitely want kind of double defensive or stuff. But the strategy of FPL manager has always been kind of getting the 4.5, isn't it, at the start. And actually, they've opened it up with his interesting choice because I think even like Alisson, how many 76 points last year? 5.5 million. You don't really want to use a Liverpool spot there, but that's great. And that's that's um, a, a number he's hit before in his first season, also got 176. Loris was the second highest scoring keeper last year. We're probably expecting... Uh, better returns defensively from Tottenham this year and more consistency. And yet he scored more than Edison last year. So I think 5.5 for those three is interesting. The one that stood out that people gone, oh, I'm not sure why he's not 5.5 is obviously Edward Mendy. Then he only had 130 last year. Now, a lot of that's to do with the fact, obviously, in the last two months, they kind of threw the towel in, didn't they? Yeah. They, they, they dropped short of City, Liverpool. The eyes were on the cup competitions and all the takeover stuff in the background. It kind of felt like Chelsea weren't there, I think it's fair to say, the last couple of months. But, as I mentioned on Monday's pod, we are looking at them at the moment and going, we've got to do something. 
or, or they're in danger potentially of not being part of the top four this coming season. I'm sure they obviously will do some business, but they've also lost like really good defensively and stuff. We're hearing that they might change system. What kind of impact is that? James Chilwell will speak about more once we've got the information in terms of if it looks like they might change system. Um, Mendy five obviously stands out though, I think. Yeah, uh, the five keep five million keepers kind of ruled out because only half a million more to Alisson or Edison. And from the 4.5 million keepers, there's one standout in Raya. And I don't like, I don't want the Leeds keeper in Melier or Pickford or any of Gator. I don't even know if he'll get the, sh- the jersey from Sam Johnson or if not, he'll lose it eventually. So I feel like it's Raya or Alison or Edison at 5.5. That's the kind of decision in my head at the moment. I don't feel like the 5 million bracket is interesting. I bust it on Raya because of our FPL manager's strategy of get the 4.5 in at the beginning. But I do think uh, Alisson at 5.5, if I'm not going to have a, a, another third Liverpool or another third City with Edison, is very viable this year. Thing is, and there is, a, there is a case to be made, I think, in most seasons, but not necessarily this one, that your goalkeeper is almost your most important decision at the start. Because you don't want to change it. The only time you should really be changing it, injury, wild card, really. Mm -hmm. Generally rule of thumb. And it's interesting that obviously the ownership numbers at the moment, it looks like we've got a bit of a spread with the keepers, which is good. That also tells me they've priced it right. There isn't a goalkeeper who's got that 40% number or something. I think for the 4.5s, Raya for me would be the standout. A lot of people like obviously Robert Sanchez at Brighton as well. Um, but because of the unlimited, throws a different kind of layer where I think it makes someone like Ramsdale interesting again. So if you just look Ramsdale versus Mendy, I think you probably, Chelsea would probably be better defensively than Arsenal. But if you're thinking of wildcarding sort of after game week four or even in the international break in game week eight, you don't have to make a season defining decision. You're making it for four weeks or eight weeks, right? Then it changes again on that wildcard. Then you look at a second block. I think a lot will do this. The, the, world, the unlimited is after game week 16, right? You could look at it, break that in half. Eight game weeks, eight game weeks. And that's how it works, right? If mm-hmm. you go straight down the middle and it's the international break. So the ones that have interested me most, I really like Alisson, actually, a five and a half. Really, really do. And they've obviously got a great start. But do I want to use a Liverpool spot there? Mendy obviously stands out. And Ramsdale, for me, Raya over Sanchez. Because Agreed. Brentford have got that. If it did end up going where you go, I'm okay, I'm happy, I'm happy, and you end up going all the way to sort of game week 12 or so, I think I'd rather have Raya. Yeah. Um, again, as well, if you compare, like you said, Lewis Dunk, if you do want to compare that, would I rather have Raya or Janssen, Sanchez or Dunk? If you went for that as a combination, I think it's Raya and Dunk, Agreed. for example, I think. Um, although Janssen's obviously a threat from set piece and stuff. But yeah, it's not a, not a huge choice there. But I like the fact that nobody stood out as an obvious. Mm. I mean, it's probably going to be Mendy, I think, will be the one. The 4.0 bracket is always like, oh, just get whatever. But here we've got another interesting dilemma because none of the 4.0s, in my opinion, are first choice. Correct. But second choice at some big clubs are the 4.0s. It's like it's the same as the Costas Chimikas it syndrome is. again isn't it where Robertson's out so we know we've got this 4.0 defender that's playing for Liverpool let's have it if that situation happens at Spurs City Liverpool there's three or four keepers in there at four million that you would be all over like yeah. a rash if you I think could the Liverpool one again because you kind of really really want the three outfield players not so much mm. with Kelleher's 4.0 but if say something happened to Loris or Edison in pre-season, I think you would be all over Ortega, who's their new sign-in. We think Zach Steffen's going to go on loan, or Fraser Forster, who's coming at Tottenham. You'd be all over that 4.0, and their ownership at the start will be wild Yep. if that sort of thing happened. Yep. And that's why I kind of think it's all well and good doing the drafts now. Anybody who's got the, oh, he's locked in opinion, and listen, with certain people like Salah, if you know you want to start him, if you're happy with his pre-season form, yeah, you probably are starting with him. But lower down... Listen, take one injury and change the game. 
If Hugo Lloris gets injured in preseason, everyone starts with Fraser Forster, don't they? Yeah. If Edison, I mean, he's in my squad anyway as my backup keeper. If, Ed, if Forster, Edison so. got injured, would you start with Ortega? Yeah. Depends how long and what his injury is, but yeah. And there's, I think there's a case with a 4.0, particularly with those but two. I could pair him with Raya. Do you know what I mean? So even when Edison comes back, I don't have to move Ortega on. I just have Raya there ready and yep. waiting in the wings. So it's you can pair him with a 4.5 that's going to play and ready to come come good when as soon as you need them. Yeah. Or obviously there's a few you can pair. Was did Pickford come in at four point five or yeah, five? Yeah, four point five he came in at. So you could look at like Pickford and Begovic, for example. That's the bottom end of maybe saving your money if you if you physically definitely want the number two goalkeeper. Begovic would be that for Everton at the moment. Um but I think it's interesting. I think the closer it gets, if people identify, let's say and this is the template at the moment in terms of Salah and Haaland, if you're not going for Spurs premium offensively, even if you went Kulazewski and Perisic, you'd probably look at it and go, am I using the third Tottenham spot? But then if you do go Forster and then Haaland gets injured or something, you, and you think, I want to go to Kane. Mm, difficult. Yeah, I think it's quite cute what they've done yeah, there. Yeah, uh, James and I don't often give advice, uh, as in don't do and do, but uh, just talking about Pickford, don't pick Pickford. <laughs> 4.5, I mean, it's very reasonable yeah. if they improve. If you know, they improve, yeah, there's well, a massive asterisk. That asterisk is right, big we, as a we, fucking... We've mentioned, you know, can Everton be better than Brentford this season? I don't think so. Well, I've, Brentford second season, potentially, right? We've spoken about it. Yeah. Uh, on paper right now, we'd both say not. But then the, the difference is, obviously, Tarkovsky coming in at centre-back will make a, a bit of a difference for Everton. They'll have a bit of a presence back there. And we'll see the impact that he can have, right? It can level up some of the other players alongside him, possibly. We shall see. I think Raya would be a, a fixture choice over Pickford, anyway. Mm. Raya, as I mentioned a number of times, points per match last season. Um Really good. If you just look at the points per match last season, which is three point nine, he's, he's always mean. yeah, he's always decent with goalkeepers because the kind of ninety minute players, right? But if you, if you compare them to so Raya, it was four four point zero. Gator was four point zero when he played. Just then pick three point three per match. But then there's there is scope for Everton to improve, and there is scope for Brentford to get worse. Defenders um, like Trent is the one that's the far and away. Ridiculous ownership at 7.5. I can't see a scenario where I don't start with him and I don't start with Cancelo. And I can't see how I don't start with Perisic, assuming he's fit. I can't see a scenario where I don't start with those. Those three, yeah, it's difficult to imagine. The, the Reese James I'm less keen on. Yeah, I, he never the, made it into And there's a couple drafts. of reasons for that. I think one is Mendy's price. Mm. You think, look, we're not expecting Mendy to match Reese James. But in terms of a little bit of coverage... In terms of at least blocking the, the defensive points potentially, um, and also you've got the alternative in Chilwell as well to go against that. Could you make a case for Robertson over Trent? Yeah, sure. I mean, second half of the season, uh, Robertson was flying. This is the but point. It's a gamble. I, I do look at it a little bit and think the ownership numbers are so high that. Could it be that you're better off going Robertson, Chilwell? The City one's harder to go against. Corella if he signs. If Tottenham don't buy Jed Spence or a right wing back, Doherty instead of Perisic. Mm. That's a really interesting idea and you're saving the money. And it almost feels like you're, you're punting the possibility of getting the value a bit more. It makes the three-mium easier. If you then wanted Salah, Son, Holland, it does make that easier without compromising a couple of other spots, for sure. I'm interested in your take on these 4.0s because if you can sell me that you think any 4.0s are going to play and worth it, it means I can bypass an extra 4.5. My plan was to have two 4.5 defenders alongside those three. I'll, but I'll, if there's a 4.0 that you think will definitely play or is worth considering, I'm quite up for that. But from the ones that were there, meh. I'll sell you four. Go on then. Um and I think it will probably be one, at least one of these four is going to be an obvious go-to. Um, they're going to start the season. And they're not all obvious right now. And there's two of them you can't really put in your draft at the moment if you're trying to be serious about it because they're both at Liverpool. Nat Phillips was a name I mentioned uh, when we was talking about Bournemouth the other day. 
now obviously he's a Liverpool player at the moment, we think he'll probably end up going back on loan to Bournemouth. When I mentioned him in terms of, you're not going to start with Nat Phillips, I assumed he'd be 4.5. Yeah, okay. <laughs> he's 4.0. So Nat Phillips, Nico Williams. Baby Trent. Baby Trent. Uh, Liverpool bought Calvin Ramsey. Williams is either going to be available for transfer or loan. Fulham and Nottingham Forest not in the forest are the two names being mentioned most. Um, he obviously finished the season on loan at Fulham as well mm. as a star. So if he goes to Fulham, he'll play every week. He could be this season's Tino Livramento. Uh, another one who's of interest because I think he'll get a move is a Tottenham player, Joe Roden. Um, I think he'll... he'll he, it was some rumours of Roma, actually. Um, but I think he'll end up going on loan or being bought by a lower-end Premier League team. Okay. He shouldn't be dropping out of the Premier League. Like, he is Premier League level. Anyone who watches Wales will know. He's just, he's just not the right fit for Tottenham at the moment. But he'll be a Premier League level centre-back, and he should stay at the level. Um, 4.0. If he goes somewhere, he'll start every week, mate. Mm-hmm. The other one um, is Nathan Patterson at Everton, who they got, obviously, from Rangers in January and didn't play at all. Part yeah. of that was because of injury and stuff. Um, and also a, a reliance on using Seamus Coleman because of his experience and leadership ability within that Everton team. Patterson will get minutes this year. Um, whether he'll start the season, we'll find out in pre-season. But an offensive one, anyone who's seen him for Rangers of Scotland previously will know, offensive potentially from right back as well. So there's four. I, think I we cannot were... believe that none of them four will be of interest. Agreed. Uh, I can't believe Patterson didn't get minutes back in the last year. It was a weird one yeah. where he came in January and we were all like, what was the point in getting him if you're not going to use him? Especially when they were so fucked for money as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> and they didn't use him, but so, bought him. Yeah, I, th- I think they're all viable. You're right. I think if one of them becomes very clearly available, then um, yeah, it's it's one that I'll jump all over. Uh, my placeholder was Eric Bailly. You know, the- <laughs> not going to have none uh, of that. Is he four as well? Yeah. He's been linked with Fulham as well. Okay. So that's another one to put on your list if he goes. Yeah. Again, if he goes to Fulham, he'll play every week, won't he? Yeah, I think so. So to say that there's nothing there, it's not obvious at the moment, there is. And what that means is if you're going with them four big defenders, Perisic, James, Cancelo, Trent, Alexander-Arnold, why are you going to go for a, a, a 4.5 defender when you've got these 4.0 guys? Next to them, yeah. And they're going to play. Unless there's something you think will definitely play. So from the 4.5s, I've, I only put five on the watch list. And I know there's more of interest than that, but that's all I've done. Three of them are Leicester players. Fafana, Pereira. No, sod okay. that. You're attacking Pereira, players, Castagne, and James Justin. All 4.5. Yeah. And it might be that something develops in pre-season where that becomes really interesting for them. I started with Pereira last year at five and a half. It was a big gamble. Um, and he started well for me. 12-pointer opening day, then got an injury in, in game week three. 4.5. Plays every week. Same with Castagna. That's good. That's good. Eight Nori at Wolves. I know you spoke about Johnny a lot, but I would prefer eight Nori. There's also rumours of him potentially getting a move. There's supposedly some interest at Chelsea, which would possibly kill him as an asset if that did happen. Again, Ryan Sessegnon. If something happens to Perisic in pre-season and Reggion moves, Sessegnon's starting the season, isn't he? Yep. These don't have to be decisions forever. Ryan Sessegnon at four and a half. Yes, please. Yeah. So, but I feel like when you've got those, those offensive, exciting 4.5s, who wants to fucking buy a Ben White and, and even Tommy Duncan and stuff? Dunk. Dunk, Dunk takes a few set pieces. He gets in the end of a few set pieces. I don't mind Lewis Dunk. He's, he's, a, he's a 140, 150 point player, but I don't know. Tommy Asu, I'd look at that and think, that's a transfer waiting to happen, isn't it? I just don't see the attacking returns in him. No, I don't think there will. A, a lot of that is quite dependent on perhaps Kieran Tierney's fitness as well because they obviously have this lopsidedness to the left when Kieran Tierney is available. Um, Tommy Asu plays a more withdrawn defensive fullback role. Um, five millions, I only listed three. Uh, and I've mentioned all of them on this pod already. Trippier, Matty Cash, Matt Doherty, where if it falls into place and it's right structurally... But if I go to those guys, I want to start them every week, mm. I think. And, and Trippier's got Liverpool and City in the first five, which is a little bit off-putting. Again, you don't have to make the decision for 38 weeks or even 16 weeks. There's a wild card that's going to be used, definitely, in sort of probably the first 12. 
I'll speak about it tomorrow, but the latest you use the wild card is the end of 14 and then slam 15, 16 as a couple of back-to-back free hits, basically, which I'll discuss as an idea tomorrow. Um, five and a half, I mean, Perisic stands out. So obviously, at that price, I don't even list anybody else. Mm. What for? <laughs> no. So not, I'm a not, I, it, as I said, and I said this on the Patreon Q&A pod we did on Monday, I said if he had a great pre-season, I thought he would start as the highest owned player going into the season. It's not that at the moment. I wouldn't be surprised if he becomes it, if he has a really good pre-season. I don't see, see him, could see him being above 60% ownership at the start if it looks obvious. Midfielders, we've got kind of a bracket again. So you've got your KDB, Sun and Salah sitting right up there as that 12 to 13 million. Um, nobody really uh, in that window then down to the Bowens, eight and a half down to the eight particularly. But you do have a lot of talent between eight and eight and a half million. And we've talked about them all. Luis Diaz, Kulusevski, Mason Mount, Jared Bowen. Bukaya Saka, like that's a midfield in itself that will score you enough points and all players that you'd be comfortable captaining um, if you really wanted to. And then there is hidden gems in that six, six and a half million. Someone from that bracket is going to step up as well, whether it be a Odegaard or, or um, Zaha, I think is probably a bit expensive. Um, so I think there's a lot of choice in that in that area. I think it's dictated by how premium do you want to go? And then that dictates, are you shopping in the 8 million window or are you shopping at six, six and a half? If we look at the template at the moment, uh, it looks something like um, Salah, Diaz, Grimera's sort of price level yeah. six, Neto five and a half. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, it was in every kind of pre-game draft that I'd seen from other sites and stuff. Um, and probably a 4.5. That's probably where it's at. From Sonny and KDB down to Jared Bowen at eight and a half, all you've got in between is Sterling and Fernandez at 10. Mm. Um, Sterling, we think, probably is going to go to Chelsea, but that's a big call to start with him when considering what we went through yesterday about captaincy in the early season. Yeah. Even if you put Sterling in there, I don't think he'd ever look anywhere near the best. Same applies to Bruno Fernandes, which I think could go either way with obviously Ten Hag coming into Manchester United. And it, it could, it's probably unlikely to have a negative effect, I would say, on Bruno Fernandes. He's likely to have a positive, whether it be worth the money, difficult to say at the moment. Maybe Ronaldo leaving would be good. I really like Bowen's price at eight and a half. He's the one player I think I've really got in mind at the moment where I don't like his fixtures, but I like him. Mm. If Jared Bowen played for Tottenham or Chelsea and it had the season that he had last year, he'd be 10 million plus. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. And a, a lot of his returns were in the second half or second three quarters of the season as well. Kind of from was December, slow start. Mid Christmas, basically, mm. yeah. Well, what they say is they've they've done a correlation between when he started dating Danny Dyer and when his points started returning. And there's a very distinct correlation. Um, but yeah, it was in the second half of the season. So he really, he finished like a train for sure. Um, talk to me about this low end. I like to look at the low end because that gives me freedom to think about the top end. Okay, we'll Four come back to the top fives, end. Um, <coughs> excuse me, what a cough there. One of the interesting ones I saw yesterday was... Andreas Pereira's move to Fulham from Manchester United. He's priced at 4.5. Do you think he will play at Fulham, be a starter at yeah. Fulham? And so suddenly 4.5 is a Subject to what they do in the rest of their business. Sure. But yeah. And, and there it is. Viable. 4.5. It's noticeable that he's already in 8% of the team. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we haven't actually found the gem here where it's like, oh, no one hasn't noticed this. So Andreas Pereira will be popular. <laughs> 4.5 or so. Um, and that will grain traction if he moves to Fulham and it looks like it's going to start the season to the point that he will almost definitely be the highest owned 4.5. But there's danger in that. What's the danger? If he goes down in value, there you go. you're going to lose it. So a couple of names just to keep an eye on and there's one standout from four other names that I want to mention. Um, a couple of younger players. Uh, Crescenzo Somerville at Leeds might be an interesting one to keep an eye on in terms of his pre-season form. It's also a bit subject to what Leeds do in the market. You might remember Suj 
Brighton player Jeremy Sarmiento he got injured quite seriously at, yep. at West Ham in uh, I want to say the December period so his minutes were really limited because of injury there's some hopes for him and he, he wouldn't be the first player that suddenly Potter had had a look at for a long time and suddenly bang he's in the team mm-hmm. um, I mentioned Jakob Moda being similar to that this time last year and obviously Moda himself suffered a very serious injury means he'll be out till New Year um, anyone who's watched Watched England under 19s over the last couple of weeks. Probably quite excited by Carney Chukwamika at Villa. Mm, say again. Carney Chukwamika. You, you always ask me to pronounce his name, and it's not one of the more difficult ones, actually. It's the exotic overseas names. If he's an Englishman, I'll, I'll, I'll be all right most of the time. The thing is, I can't see him starting at the moment. If I look at Villa at the moment with uh, Bubikar Kamara coming in as probably the anchor, you've got John McGinn, Jacob Rams is a player we really like. If they go over diamonds, you've got Coutinho in front of that. Don't see him starting. There is one real other standout, 4.5. Um, and Tom Med, our Brentford correspondent, will be screaming this. Josh De Silva mm. at Brentford is 4.5. Had a real injury hit season. Think back to last summer. He was not just injuries. Tom kept it. He's he, he Tom kept sent us. off as well. Yes, he? <laughs> as yes. soon as he came back, he got, him sent, yeah. he got himself sent off at Tottenham in the League Cup semi final through the whole COVID shutdown season, and then he got himself fit, played against Newcastle, and got sent, <laughs> sent off, off. Which then, ironically, I, I want to say was also Ericsson's first appearance was yeah. that game as well. And so then from there, he didn't get so much of a look in. Now Ericsson's obviously it looks almost definitely like he's going to Manchester United. If he has a fit pre-season, it's not a guarantee that Brentford will buy to replace Ericsson. They may just shove him back in. And he's offensive and he can play as a 10. Yeah. So Josh De Silva for me is the one at the moment. I can see me potentially starting with De Silva and Pereira, for example. There's a couple of interesting ones going up a little bit up to 5 million as well, Serge. So I noticed Leon Bailey. Joe. Yeah. If he's fit and they've got good opening fixtures and it, and he plays in pre-season... Minutes, mate. Uh, I'm, I'm not against Leon Bailey in terms of quality he's, of footballer, he's, price is right. It's not pick. a long-term decision, is it? Declan Rice is five million. Who are you going to buy, Bailey or Rice? But I wouldn't be buying Bailey for... Declan Rice would be a player I'd go, I'm not fussed about this. I want to... A f- two three pointer every week yeah, going forward exactly for a long that. time. Bailey would be. I'm punting in three four weeks. So I'm going to move it on. Okay. Yeah. Different strategies there. Mm. But at the start of the season, I'd go Rice because I just know it's my two points guaranteed every week. Some weeks will be three, and every now and then it will be a six or a, or an eight. Um, also, uh, man of the match potential there with Declan Rice because you know talisman and all that. So I would. I, I I don't disagree. If he gets in the team, I'll be all over it. But. I want to see it before I, I go there with Bailey. No, that's fair, and I would be mm. I would be the same. And to be honest, because of the four point fives, I wouldn't overly consider these players. Just shout out a few more. It doesn't mean these are the only players under consideration. Chiquinho at Wolves is one to keep an eye on. Uh, showed flashes towards the end of end last, last season. season was decent. If he gets a good preseason, particularly possibly if they change system as well, his minutes might increase. They have a good run. It's an alternative to Yanetos and stuff. Nathan Teller at Southampton, same price. They're short of attacking options at the moment. Uh, Anthony Alanga at Manchester United. If he impresses Ten Hag, he's five. He's tasty at five, if, I think. If, he, look, if we got into the start of the season and say Sancho Rashford aren't looking up to it for whatever reason, it looks like he's going to play. Five million. I like Moises Casado at Brighton. Um, and one who would have been really interesting, but for these 4.5 options. Is Ryan Yates at Nottingham Forest, actually. Central midfield player who likes to get advanced quite a bit. Um, but at the moment, I wouldn't overly say that any of them was of particular interest because of the price. Uh, 5.5s are marked Neto. Another Wolves player, Morgan Gibbs-White, who's been strongly linked with a potential move to Everton or Nottingham Forest over the last 24 hours or so. Your own Visser. Is a really interesting one. Another one finished the season quite well, and they've got that long extended run we've spoken about up to sort of like game week three to roundabouts game week twelve. So there are some there. I think they need to be identifiable where you look at it in preseason. You go, yeah, I'm happy with that. Um, Neto, 
didn't show me anything in the last sort of two months of last season once he was back and admittedly had a horrendous injury to make me think, oh, I'm going to dive into that. Now, admittedly, their form really tailed off as well. Um, and they do have good fixtures, but there might even be alternatives within Wolves if Gibbs White stays. If Gibbs White stays, I think it'll start the season for him. Um, and Chiquinho, obviously, at cheaper as well, might also be another one to watch during pre-season. There are some some there, Serge. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And then what about the forward line? Because like we mentioned, the 4.55 bracket in there is not great. Undev maybe is a standout 5.5. Um, but I think most people are going either with one up front or two up front. One up front would be Kane or Haaland. If you're adding a striker, it would be at the value of Jesus or less. 7.5s, you've got Watkins or uh, Ivan Tony at 7 or any of those guys. It means that third striker slot, just go cheap. You did such a speech there, I, I kind of feel obliged not to go through the 6 to 8 million midfielders. Uh, well... <laughs> Um, there's the, the eight million is is a given, right? We know who's there. That's of interest. The six to eight. I mean, there is a lot in there. I, I drafted in Gamerish. I've seen Ward Prowse six point five. I think he's Mister Consistent. There, there is a lot in there. I just don't know where it fits in with people's team structure or squad structure. What do you do? I disagree. If we look at that template at the moment, we're looking at say Gamer is six million in there. So. We have to be looking at, at options around about. I think that because price. people are, I think in. I think it's because people are scared that the four point fives and fives won't play. But if they have a bit more confidence in the four point five and fives, I think they'll drop down and use the money elsewhere. I think the two standouts at six at the moment are both Arsenal players. It's Martinelli. Um, I, the problem with him is it's versus kind of Smith Rowe, and we don't really know as yet. And Fabio Vieira, as I spoke about a lot on, on Monday's podcast, I think it's quite interesting. If he has a good pre-season, he'll be under the radar a bit, I think. Uh, Rashford, six and a half, we've mentioned. If he looks like it's going to play, it's potentially gold, isn't it? I like Jack Grealish at seven. I think Harvey Barnes at, at seven is interesting. And then you've got that that cluster of eight millions just under Jared Bowen. I think that's the reason why Jared, Jared Bowen won't be overly popular as well. You've got so many options Cheaper. just under him plus West Ham's fixtures. Um, Kudaszewski, Diaz, Saka, Foden, Mount. Again, Foden again is possibly subject to City's injury status. Mount, we know, will be a, a regular starter for Chelsea. Morris. Mm. Morris <laughs> is the ambitious one, isn't it? But go, remember, go big or go home. Too um, often it's go home. Remember what I said, what Luke said about perhaps Holland and Morris early on yeah. might not necessarily work together. That's a reference back to Monday's podcast. So there's options there if you dive in. I'll let you go to the forwards. It's how you spread your money. This is the decisions to be made now. Uh, Forwards, Holland and Kane, Jesus or Watkins or or Tony. I I, I can't believe Jesus' price, to be totally honest. Yeah, Yeah, me too. I can't see how I can go without him. Well, I can see how I can go without him. They're not trustworthy. And there's a case to say he's not trustworthy. But I feel like I've talked myself into it already. By saying yesterday, like if he's eight and a half, that's really interesting. Eight oh is, my God, he's eight. Give, yeah, I'm I'm likely, very likely to go with him. And I want to go with Holland at the start as well. I know a lot of people are like, he's not tried and trusted. We don't know how City are going to play. I, I think Holland uh, is going to be in for me that game week one at the moment. That game week two without Holland is frightening. Mm. This is the problem. But the team, and I will look at this for the Friday podcast we do, it's looking at a team with Josh Salah. I've spoken about this idea in terms of, I think from the, the, the let's, let's use Kane and Son as one at the moment. From the three big hitting teams, if you were to just go one premium, it's probably got to be Salah in terms of your trust to ease every week, for example. The team you can potentially have by only going with Salah from the attacking premiums really will open up some doors. It's worth considering could you start with a front line of even three, like for example, Jesus, you know, Callum Wilson's got Forrest at home mm. opening day, Ivan Tony, Villa, Watkins has got a good few opening fixtures. Um, those are the four that I've kind of listed around between seven and eight million that are the real interest. I think Wilson would be a real kind of short in and out. Uh, Tony would be a longer term pick. Watkins would also probably be a short term in and out. Jesus can 
Arsenal got a good sort of opening seven eight or so. I, I, eight million's great price, mm. but it's not. It's just it's too cheap. But then interestingly, again, because someone would be thinking this, well, Jesus at eight million ain't going to score more than Trent. We gotta have some forwards. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> that's isn't it? the difference. That's the difference between comparing the the defenders and midfielders in and that. You've got to have some forwards. A lot of us, I think, would like to go Holland and have two four point fives, and it is still a way to go potentially, or well, even Jesus and two four point fives. That's what I might even look at as as an idea, just to see how it, it maps out. What's your thoughts on the cheapies? Cheapos. Um. I, f- I think one thing with the cheapies is there's still going to be get players introduced to the game that are going to be particularly cheap. Uh, five and f- 5.5. 5. Take it, Emmanuel Dennis, for example. If he signed at West Ham, what do you think he'd come in at? Five? Five and a half? He ain't going to come in at six or six and a half, is he? I bet he would. Minimum six. Wow. I think that'd be too expensive. Wait, Antonio, seven and a you're half. Not, you're not going to get a forward that's going to join now and add to the 4.5 list. Mm. That's probably it. Can't see things getting added now that would go at the bottom level, except perhaps four point five million midfielders, or if someone adds a kind of development squad, four million or something kids. like that. Defender yeah. similar with the keepers, perhaps. Um, it's difficult. I feel like those I mentioned in and around that sort of seven million value of the, of the, the free Wilson, Tony, Watkins, Bamford feels too expensive. I mean, who's priced Calvert Lewin at eight million? <laughs> At the moment, I think there's a little bit of well, Richarlison's not around, so he's going to be right, the man. But how's Calvert Lewin the same price as Jesus? That nah, is wrong. It's wrong. Something is wrong, it. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for right. sure. Um, you know, Calvert Lewin's getting that trick opening day now, don't you? It's the obvious one, isn't it? What are your thoughts on Antonio? Seven and a half. <sighs> I'd rather find the money to go to Jesus. I'd probably rather find the money for Jared Bowen. Yeah. Um, and catcher. I guess he's not going to be first choice now. Arguably would be interesting if he was. Anthony Marshall is one perhaps to keep an eye on if he stays at Manchester United during this pre-season. Yep. The, uh, six millions, you've got kind of Dakar in and around there. Ian Acho, six and a half. Their ones, maybe if Vardy gets injured. I mean, Vardy, nine and a half. That's a potential route, isn't it? If you really want to... I feel like if I really want to go against Haaland, I would look at maybe going Jesus and Vardy. Mm-hmm. Vardy's got, what, Brentford at home, Southampton at home, first three. It's decent. Yep. And I, I I think he likes playing against Arsenal from memory as well. Is the away game in in game week two. Two 5.5s stood out at the moment. Undav, who's been mentioned, um, and I, as as dug himself a grave on Black Box Saturday night, I watched that back. He said Undav will definitely become first choice. He did say, not necessarily at the start of the season, to be fair. Yeah. Um, the other one's Breyer. The points dodger. Mm. So there's a few that might be interested in him. Yeah, if he moves, definitely. Five and a half? Yeah, I'd be all over that. If he ended up at West Ham or anywhere, any other club other than Chelsea, I think I'd go with that. He's basically, yes, he's a bad 5.5 million asset at Chelsea. But a great 5.5 anywhere else. Yeah. I think it'd be popular if he moves. Um, I've spoken about the 4.5s. The others probably need injuries to open up. To be of real interest, the sort of five millions. I mean, there's nothing at five million. I mentioned about and and sit and Siso at Brighton. I don't think it'll start the season. People like Adam Armstrong at Southampton, five and a half. We interested. Muniz is back up to to Mitrovic. Uh, their fixtures are a little bit off putting as well. Fulham, uh, Dominic Solanke. They've got a bad start as well. Bournemouth. I've said a number of times. I think he'll have a good season, but. I'm not sure I want any of that at the start of the season, to be totally honest with you. Um, the strikers, you're always going to end up with something quite template I think, because it's just not as many it's 23 spots. choices as yep. such. Yeah. So I think you can go to 4.5 million forwards. I also think the way that the, the pricing of the other positions means you could go with three. One of the things I definitely... And I've, have you done a draft yet? Uh, I wouldn't call it a draft. I haven't. I love how FPL tried to fuck us up from the start, by the way. Putting putting the, the armband on the player who's suspended for game week one was the majority of auto picks I saw. Oh, well, Richarlison? Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? I didn't yeah, see no, it. They, op- they opened the game. Richarlison auto picked to captain for a lot of teams and then uh, the FA revealed they were going to ban him from game week <laughs> one, which is, is interesting. Um, 
I think it's a little bit wrong. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not stressing about it. I mean, it's probably Burnley fans are complaining about it more than than Tottenham fans. I think um, five two three one. I want to look at five two three one. Sorry, five two three. I don't know why I said the one. I was confused. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm playing five a one man bench. Five, five in goal. Yeah. Um, no five two three. Is that a formation you're allowed to play? Says the content creator. Yeah, I'd want to look at it. Yeah. And I want to look at it because if there's three, four point five, I, I think there's two. If Pereira goes, I think just to Silver at the moment. Maybe if there's one more, but do I even need the one more? And look at going heavy at the back, something like Salah Diaz in midfield, front three, Holland, Jesus, Undev. It could be like Breuer if he moves, mm. for example, something like that. Um, I'd like to have a look at it, but I, I actually, again. The cheap pricing because of those four point zero defenders. As much as those premium defenders are great, there's a strong argument to go go three at the back, go two four point zeros, four point five in mid, and it will shove a little bit else up elsewhere in the team and stuff. But that there's already a, a gamble. It's not even a gamble, is it? It's a solid template on those four big defenders. Yep. Listeners, that's a rundown on the prices. I think it's been Do you fairly want to do any questions. Uh, oh, James is always tweeting it's out of a question. Featured pods this is week. This, is this? Is this? Might be something we haven't theme? covered. Uh, people are going to think we don't talk to each other, mate. We don't. Uh, let's have a look. We just rock we up, should. go record. <laughs> uh, where are we? Having a look at the teams and fixtures in detail. Where's your pricing one? Last night, mate. It's got a picture of my mate Richarlison in it, who suspended for game week one. In your own time, Serge. It's not, oh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, I know here it's there. Go. Why is it under tweets and replies as opposed to tweets? But tweet, tweet. Rob Pick, who would you say is the most underpriced asset and the most overpriced asset? Who was drunk at FPL Towers when they made Connor Cody 5 million? I don't think Connor Cody at 5 million is in the top 10 scoring defenders I last think so. season. Yeah, so, yeah, fair enough. Uh, Calvert Lewin at 8, I think, is up there. I mean, it's worth saying no one's going to buy Connor Cody <laughs> 5 million um, who did you say sorry uh, Calvert-Lewin at 8 feels very overpriced it feels it feels yeah I, I'm sure that's what he was last year mm. 8 way and a half I think that deserved year. a little bit of a drop off personally the same applies to Patrick Bamford as well um, although Bamford's numbers the season before particularly were were very good I guess it's clearer with Richarlison gone that Calvert-Lewin will play through the middle but it's even he needs a pre-season to get himself fit. Same applies to Bamford. Um, most underpriced player is Trent. Yeah. When 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 the, the first price, it was Liverpool first? Oh, Liverpool was Saturday morning, weren't they? Mm. I literally just tweeted 7.5 laughing emoji. Yeah. I expected 8.5, so there's a, a good million in it. Um, I, I think I want to say he finished at 8.4 last season or something. Where have they got 7.5 from? I mean, people know my opinion. He'd be minimum nine for me. But because of what I said about the ownership, I don't think he's a definite starter, actually. You can go again. It's not like Robertson can't outscore him, particularly over a smaller period. If 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 you're planning to wildcard sort of um, game week four-ish or something like that, why can't Robertson outscore Trent over that small period? Well, he can, can't he? So I don't think, because there's competition, I don't think it's a, oh, I, would, I wouldn't sit here right now and say any players must have. No way. Like, even these with a the big ownership defensively, there are alternatives. There's Chilwell. There's possibly Doherty. There is Robertson. The Man City one's a little bit more difficult. But then if Cucurella comes in and Cole Walker's injured for the start of the season, you've got a two million saving there. Yep. Okay, Cucurella's not going to get the attacking returns of Cancelo. But again, short period. Can he match it? Yeah. People in the City team, you give Kevin De Bruyne the ball in the halfway line, you might have an assist, right? JJ Romano wants to know what your thoughts are on Antonio as a go-to second forward. I think that's one for you, Serge. Well, he's priced at 7.5 and West Ham clearly need a second striker, a backup striker. Depending on the quality of the striker that we get in, kind of dictates what to do with Antonio. Because no, if someone else doesn't come in who's of anywhere near the quality... He's going to be the go-to. And so then I think it's viable. We've talked about this five-sub situation. And we know that he's 
uh, injury prone Antonio. He wasn't too bad last season, but in terms of uh, muscle injuries, if we get a decent second striker, I reckon he'll get subbed a lot. That's my point. He'll get he'll come off on the seventy eighty minute mark to try and preserve his hamstrings as long as possible. And I want to see what happens with that. To be honest with you, I would just make a point on Antonio, which had a major in last season. Um, was that I think he struggled with fatigue um, for a couple of reasons. One, it was his first season in a long time where those hamstrings basically did hold out and he did stay fit for the majority of the season. And obviously there was the added West Ham playing in Europe, right? Yeah. So uh, not so much in the first half of the season, but then there were times like he played against Seville and stuff, didn't he? Where he was playing Thursday, was he going to play Sunday? Was they preserving him? Most of the time he played, didn't he? So I think he had a season himself like he hadn't really had. And if you go back to sort of September, October, he was the go-to, wasn't he? he? Was I started with him last season. I've always had the opinion with him that uh, fixtures weren't so important and he can score against the best at any time because he's such a handful if he can isolate and get one-on-one against people. It might be that the break does him really good, actually. Could be. And then he, he's ready for this season, knowing what he's gone he through. He started like a train better. last season um, at the at the beginning of the year, and everybody was all over it. And then it, obviously it tailed off a little bit. But the first three or four game weeks last year, he was all over it. So, um, yeah, he needs, to be, he needs to be more selfish for me. This is a lot of good work for the team, yep. I think. Um, but I think he needs to demand the ball more, and for for the, him to demand people be more direct into him and quicker. Um, but probably no to answer the, the question. Yeah, I mean, we've covered off a lot of the other questions in terms of people asking who are the best at this bracket. And we've, we've kind of sort of done that. There was a couple, one player that we didn't mention um, that I thought, oh, interesting, was uh, ASM. Obviously, he was a forward last year, wasn't he? He's moved back to a midfielder, St. Maximum. I'm sure he was a forward last year in the game. Yes. I and think now he he's was. a midfielder at six and a half. I don't know if because Gamerish has come in at half a million cheaper people are going to overlook St. Maximum. But St. Maximum is six and a half midfielder. It's interesting. Um, I wouldn't get stuck into thinking about Newcastle generally too much anyway, because I'm sure they will try and buy at least one more attacking player as well. Is he potential value at six and a half million? Yeah, I mean, right now, if you said, right, the season's starting tomorrow, you've got to start with, I mean, I've kind of put Rashford on the watch list and not put him on it. But if I'd start the season tomorrow... I'd have to pick St. Maximum over, over Rashford, Rashford, wouldn't I? Yeah. So, yeah, of course he can absolutely be considered. Got a great opening day fixture. I think with them specifically, um, it's bright away game week two. And for me, that's a, a far harder fixture than what the FDR shows. It's not a green as far as I'm concerned. I know their home form's a little bit in there. That's not, bright away is not a green fixture as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I don't think the opening is as good as it looks. I feel like it's one of them St. Maximum... And I feel this about the Newcastle players generally at the moment, that uh, they've got City in game week three as well. If you go with one, they blank game week one, there'd be an urge. Mm. I don't, ideally, I don't want to make a transfer in game week two. would be an ideal strategy. I uh, wouldn't rule it out, but it's probably a no for me. Yep. There we go. That's a rundown of the prices for you listeners. Tomorrow, we've probably got the, the, the pod that people look forward to the most or the topic that people look forward to most. Chip, chip, chips. Uh, I am not going to be able to predict for you what game week 36 is going <laughs> to look like now. Um, but yes, we'll go through... Definitely the first half of the season we can have a look at in terms of fixture swings. It's when It's going to be something time be, that yeah. you can refer to pretty much at uh, any point, probably till the oh. FA Cup starts and stuff. That's the idea. Indeed. So it will be an overview of, of chip strategy. Um, there are some things that are very different in terms of... A lot of you won't want to think about it now, so it's fine, crack on, skip it. But second half of this season coming is going to look a bit different to last season. There are some things that are going to be different. It also makes possibly a little bit more unpredictability, um, even if we account for, hopefully, touch wood, no COVID postponements this season, the stuff the stuff that we can't predict. Um, but we'll look at wildcard ideas, early bench boosts, early triple captains. It's not going to be on the table, I don't think. There's basically no chance of double game week before the unlimited transfers. I'll say that now. Nice. So uh, make sure you're subscribed wherever you are listening to the podcast. And we'll be back at you tomorrow. Stay safe. Look after yourselves. And ciao for now. Thanks, everyone. Be nice to each other. Cue music, please, man child.